Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's inaugural professorial lecture. My name is Liz Stewart and I am the first Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University. And on behalf of the Vice-Chancellor, who's very sorry she can't be here this evening, and indeed the whole University, I welcome you. Maria is a wonderful personification of the global community we are part of here at the university. Her academic and professional career spans continents and enriches the university, both in terms of her teaching and her research. I think that's her son. <laughs> Hello, welcome. <laughs> Maria was born in rural Ecuador. Her parents were farmers in the Andes Mountains. Wanting a better life for Maria and her siblings, her parents responded to the welcome Australia offered to migrants at the time and took up the offer of sponsorship to emigrate to Australia. Setting up life in Australia, Maria's parents channeled all their efforts to get their children as good an education as possible, having barely finished primary school themselves. In fact, education was held so highly in Maria's family that her mother went back to finish her high school certificate when she was in her 60s. Following secondary school, Maria went to the University of Sydney to study a Bachelor of Science, covering biology, chemistry, the history and philosophy of science, and eventually majoring in psychology. Upon graduation, Maria got a scholarship to do her PhD at the University of New South Wales. Whilst a PhD student, Maria got another scholarship to spend six months in Finland as part of a research team focused on Maria's area of research, auditory cognitive neuroscience. Finland eventually became home for several years. After spending two years at the University of Helsinki as a postdoc, Maria was poached by the Nokia Corporation to work in their e-learning team in Helsinki. While working at Nokia, uh, Maria continued publishing research articles drawing on the real-world experience that being in industry offers. After two years, Maria and her husband, hooked on life in Europe, decided to move to the UK rather than to return to Australia. Maria's UK career started at the psychology department at the University of Portsmouth, followed by six years at Brunel University, drawn to their strong cognitive neuroscience focus in psychology. She then sought to broaden her career horizons to move to the University of Winchester in 2013 to take up the headship of psychology. Marie's contributed a huge amount to the success of psychology here at Winchester. Psychology is one of our largest courses. And Maria was first head of psychology head of department, um, and now she continues her work with a strong focus on research. Maria's area of research, which we'll learn more about tonight, is into the brain and how we learn languages, as well as the use of technology to support how we learn languages. Maria, we are all endlessly thankful for your service uh, to um, both teaching and research here at Winchester. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming 
Professor Maria Uther. Thank you very much, Liz, uh, for that introduction. Um, it's, it's very kind words um, about my life and my uh, history and training, um, and my, indeed my contributions here. Uh, and thank you all for joining us uh, today uh, to hear me speak about my passion, which is sound. Um, I always had an interest in sound, even from a very early age. <laughs> Um, I've enjoyed learning other languages, um, trying new words and learning to pronounce them. I've really enjoyed music. And at one point I thought, I'm going to perhaps you know, explore being a DJ and mixing tracks and things like that. Went off to the careers advisor at, at high school and with this wonderful idea. And I was told, no, 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 that's, 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 that's going to be far too boring for you. You need something far more scientific. So here I am. <laughs> Um, so, um, in terms of kind of where I'm headed with this lecture, I guess, uh, just to give you an overview, uh, I'll start with a, a little bit of an exploration of what is sound, why it's important, um, an overview of where I am with my research, and I guess three main current themes. It's, it's difficult to choose exactly where I, where I head with 20-odd years of research. Um, but I've chosen three main areas to focus on today. So um, the first is a sort of research program around does who you are speaking to change how you speak and are we doing it with some kind of purpose? And we'll, we'll unpick this a little bit more. Secondly, does the brain adapt to your hearing experience? So does the kind of sounds that we're exposed to change the way our brains are, are processing them? And how do we sensibly use mobile devices for learning? Um, uh, as Liz mentioned, I was part of Nokia e-learning team. And um, within that uh, role, I developed an interest and started publishing in the field of mobile learning, as, it, as, as it's now called. And then finally, um, just some conclusions and future directions for research. So I'm not going to labour too much over where I, who I am, but uh, just broadly speaking, my alma mater was uh, University of New South Wales, where I did my PhD in auditory cognitive neuroscience. And my research has been, spanned many years of basic auditory perception research, uh, studying people's responses to their beeps and tones, um, but as well as that more applied research, which I, I, I hope to sort of bring out some of the flavour of today, um, and using digital technologies as well. Right, so where we go with this. So what is sound? I guess you consider, firstly, sound is a physical thing. You can consider it from that point of view. It's a physical stimulus caused by vibrating particles. It is actually waves, so we can unpick it as a, from a physical point of view. And everything is vibrations in sound, so it is literally waves of sound. Um, carried through air, which we don't see the particles within the air, but that's, that's how it's transmitted. You don't hear sound within a vacuum. Um, and speakers uh, will, inside them, have a, a drum which vibrates and carries the sound forward. But we can also understand it, I guess, from a, a psychological point of view. And I guess as a psychologist, this is where I find it fascinating. So you can have a particular physical stimulus that's heard very differently by, by different people. And a, a, just a very clear example of this is what I call the, or I was called the teenager test. So I'm just going to play a, a sound for you now. And probably most people here in the audience don't hear a single thing. Is there anybody who hears anything? So maybe a few of you. Well, lucky you. <laughs> um, normally, it's a, a hearing frequency that's not heard once you reach about age 25. So this is a perfect demonstration that I, I love to use with students. But I notice that some of my colleagues are actually putting up their hand who I expect might have lost this already. So, so well done, you, um, for, for maintaining your youth. Um, so that's a perfect example of the difference between physical stimulation and actual perception. So why is sound important? I mean, we think, well, okay, sound is you know very nice, and you know what you know what's it for? What you know why is it 
of interest to us? Well, firstly, to say that sound is important for our everyday life. It's really often an early warning communication system for us um, in, in various ways, um, to give you a couple of examples. Um, and it's also important in terms of our language. Uh, so you might have uh, a siren, which we could hear that is probably a police siren, um, and doorbells, for example. And, and I, I draw attention to this because unlike the visual modality, it's not dependent necessarily on where you're focusing your directed attention. So I can be milling about in my house, uh, pottering this way and that way, and I cannot be directing my focused attention somewhere, and I hear the doorbell. That's not the same for a visual warning. So unless a visual warning is in front of me, I'm not aware of it. Where a sound is much more able to direct our attention to, to uh, signals that are of interest to us. So it's, it's often used uh, for that as an early warning system, and the, the sirens within traffic and so on. And another example is somebody calling one's name. So in, in psychology, we know this as the cocktail party phenomenon. So you might be within a, a crowded room of people and you hear your name being spoken. Um, again, you know, part of a, an important messaging system for us. Okay, so moving on from there, we can have different kinds of sounds that we come across. Um, from a scientific point of view, of course, you know, there's, there's you know, changes in, in length, whether they're low, whether they're high-pitched, whether they're so, uh, soft or, or, or loud. And we can think about them as either being simple, what we call pure tones. So that would be something like... So you would have heard there a high-pitched tone followed by a low-pitched tone. And, and I'll show you some uh, examples of how they can be understood in terms of physics as well. Um, but they're also complex as well. So uh, music, for example, is a... So you have Yo-Yo Ma there playing Bach on the cello. And speech as well. We can bring doctors and patients, workers... And I probably don't need to tell you who that is. So we can understand who might be speaking without very much else information in front of us. So it's a, it's a very interesting system, the auditory system, because it's capable of teasing um, simple signals, but as well as much more sort of complex sig signals. And we can gain a lot of information from them. So there are physical properties that correspond to the perceptual experience. So for example, what we... we call in uh, acoustics uh, fundamental frequency. That's simply, um, as I mentioned, sound is waves, um, the uh, degree to which the waves are vibrating. And you can see up the top panel, hopefully, a quite um, quick vibration, and then followed by a slower vibration. And that is, if I'll play for you one, once again, if I can get it, the high versus low tone. Um, and we can also sort of analyse that, uh, that signal further um, with more fancier tools, which will give us an overall sort of picture of the, all the frequency within that sound. So in the case of a simple tone, there is only one. It's only oscillating at one frequency. And we can also look at a thing called fundamental frequency. So fundamental frequency is the thing that would correspond to pitch for us. And most people can understand pitch. And when we get to complex stimuli, we have more than one frequency. So this is an example of speech. Bad. So somebody saying the word bad. Um, and you can see there's the overall energy there. It looks very different to your simple sine wave tones up there. And when you break down the various frequencies within that signal, you can see there's a lot more richness to it. There's a lot more information. There's a lot more... Um, input in, in that signal than there was in the simple sinusoidal tones. And then down the bottom, again, uh, you can see that you have the fundamental frequency, which is, if you like, generating the pitch. So in speech, we can have uh, two vowel sounds, for example, that are differing in um, their vowel quality, so a versus e, 
But we can also have um, within categories, so a as a word could be, could be uh, said low or high. It could be a or a. So it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing that we, could, we, we are separating the, the pitch from the other kinds of frequencies which are important for the uh, vowel identification. So speech is a very special kind of sound. We pay attention to categories of speech sound rather than the absolute physical difference. So I, 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 I spoke to the a teenager test earlier on, but speech is another example of where there are uh, physical differences that are not necessarily heard the same way uh, between speakers. And here's an example from uh, work done by my colleagues where they demonstrate the kind of perception that you see between phonemes as a function of physical space. So if you have the physical space up here neatly separated on a continuum and different sounds going from ra to la, um, you might have a nice equal spacing. But for the English speakers, the R and the L sound is, is native to our language. We can, we can hear that without any, any difficulty. So we separate those nicely, but we separate them at, 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 a, at a quite sharp category boundary. So there is a, a sharp fall from one sound being to another sound. And I'll give you another example in a moment. Um, but say for a Japanese speaker, where they don't have R and L distinctions within their native uh, language, the physical difference isn't simply heard. So that's why you get kind of confusions like flied lice in Japanese speakers of English. So that's where that coming, is coming from. It's literally they're not hearing that difference. And within our own languages, as I mentioned, um, we don't, often don't hear differences within categories. So I'll play you an example of a, a, a continuum. So it's as similar to the diagram above, where you have nice, neat spaces of between um, s speech samples going from a continuum, so going from bad to bat in this case. But what you'll hear is not a nice, equal, spaced continuum. Bad, 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 bad. So, most people will generally hear a fairly sharp transition from bad to bat, and that's part of our speech experience. It's driven by the kind of input we've had earlier on. Okay, so how do we learn speech? Um, it's interesting that before the age of one, babies can tell the difference between sounds that create all languages. Uh, this may be news to you. Um, so if you took a, a four-month-old uh, native English speaker and gave them Hindi contrasts, um, they would be able to tell the difference. The adults wouldn't, but the <laughs> babies can. But by about 12 months, so the babies become tuned to the kinds of speech sounds they're hearing. So it comes from exposure. And there, this is sort of a segue now in, into kind of a line of research which I've followed. Um, there is growing evidence that the way we speak to babies actually matters to their language development. So to the first research question, does who we are speaking to change our speech? So I think the headline, and probably most of us would appreciate, we do talk to babies differently than to adults. So here's an example. So most of us would be very familiar with that infant-directed speech or baby sort of talk. And it used to be thought that it was just a, a cute device, you know, just about emotional and attentional engagement with, with, with the infant. Um, and to an extent, that is true. But we now know that the speech directed at infants is not just cute, as it were. So here we have some data, um, and this is from uh, colleagues prior, uh, done work prior to, to my line of research, that showed uh, that when we speak to adults, so this is a blue triangle there, so you have different vowel sounds um, being articulated for the adults, in a sort of between a much sort of shrunken space as opposed to when you are talking to the babies. So in other words, 
when the mothers are speaking, or indeed anyone is speaking to babies, they're exaggerating their vowel sounds. So yes, they are raising their pitch. Yes, the pitch contours change quite a lot, and there is that intentional engagement. But they're also doing something very important from a phonetic and linguistic point of view. They're making it easier. They're exaggerating the physical space for the language learner so that they're able to go, aha, uh -huh, that's that vowel, and that's not that vowel. Now, I came along after this piece of research was done and thought, now, that's very interesting. Is it just babies we do this for? So myself and one of my PhD students studied speech to Chinese adult females uh, because we were interested in whether this kind of vowel hyperarticulation or vowel exaggeration happened to second language learners who are adults. So we studied speech um, in mothers to their infants, but also um, them directing their speech to Chinese adult females who looked and sounded foreign. And of course, we didn't expect to hear the cutesy kind of pitch raised and contours and the melodic tone, but we actually do see the vowel changes exaggerated. So this is um, an, a plot of the area of the triangle here. And you can see that for the baby talk and the foreigner talk, they're quite equivalent uh, exaggerations um, as compared to the adult native speaker talking. So it tells us that it is a device that is being used even for adult language learners. So, and we're not conscious that we're necessarily doing this, but that's what's happening. And then I followed on with another one of my PhD students uh, to look at whether it was looking or sounding foreign that made a difference. So in the first study that we did on this, it was Chinese uh, adult speakers. Now, Chinese speakers both look foreign and they sound foreign. And so are the cues being dri driven by appearance or by perceived language competency? So we studied people who looked and sounded foreign, so Chinese speakers, as well as white Polish speakers. And what we found was there was equivalent vowel exaggeration for those pe when people spoke to them, as in our previous study, for the white uh, Polish speakers. So it does tell us that our speech changes are most driven by the language level rather than the appearance of the speaker. Okay, moving on from there. The second kind of research question that I'm interested in is, does the brain adapt to hearing experience? Now, before I kind of go into this area, it is important, I think, for me to just kind of unpack some kind of brain measures that I'm, I'm using and so that you get some understanding of, of uh, the data that I'm about to present. So a little bit of a crash course in um, the event-related brain potential. So event-related brain potentials are derived uh, from scalp-recorded activity. So we attach electrodes to people's heads, um, much like this person there. And we record their continuous EEG. Now, you might have heard EEG being a clinical tool used in epilepsy diagnosis, for example. But we also use it in experimental settings to look at the electrical activity, um, not just you know, over a long period of time, but um, in response to specific stimuli. So if you look at, if I present a stimuli to someone and I just record their raw EG, it looks fairly noisy over a single trial. So up the top, that's just a trial of one. Um, when we start to repeat presentations of the same kind of stimuli, we actually get a nice kind of averaging of the signals. So the, the signals become much more kind of cleaner and we can start to interpret and say, okay, the brain is doing this to this kind of sound. So what do my participants do in the lab? What are they literally doing when I'm studying their brain? So you have a young person there partaking in our studies. Basically, they're wearing a cap um, which contains the electrodes um, and they're using headphones to play, the, we play auditory stimuli through the headphones. And usually they're doing some kind of distractor task. So they might be watching a subtitled DVD um, if I want to look at the automatic brainwave. So I'm interested as a psychologist in what people's brains are doing when they're distracted on some other task. 
Um, so what we'd call this sort of automatic processes. But they may also do conditions where they're actually actively pressing a button or doing some kind of response uh, to certain sounds if I'm interested in their conscious and directed attention. And we get very different kinds of activities. So you might ask, what kinds of sounds? Well, anything, really. Um, but one of the things I'm interested in or have been always interested in is change detection. So how our brain kind of goes, OK, here's the standard auditory context I have right now. I'm detecting a change there. What's that about? Um, so from a very simple kind of example, we could start with um, tones and beeps that might have simple kinds of changes. So that's a, an example where you have um, simple tones and then a slightly longer tone there. Um, so it can be duration, could be intensity, as in that case, so a louder tone. But we can also look at the brain responses to abstract changes. So changes like in the direction of um, a pattern. So here is a... So same physical stimuli being presented, but the pattern of the tones change. And your brain will detect all the various differences. So this is where we get to um, the particular uh, component or wave that I look at it when, when I'm looking at event-related potentials. And it's a thing called the mismatch negativity response. Um, so we're usually, as I said, giving a, a distracted task. So they're watching silent movies or doing some kind of visual cognitive tasks. But this particular wave is, represents our brain's automatic change detector. And what you see here is a very simple uh, kind of plot of how the response changes as a function of the difference in the acoustic stimuli. So um, on the left-hand side, you have in the solid line the standard tone. So just like in the previous slide where, where I had the example, so the, the ordinary tone's coming in. And then there would be a deviant or a change in pitch and as you can see, so if the standard was 1,000 hertz and then it goes to 1,004, which is not very much of a change, you don't see much of a difference. But then as you get to a larger and larger change, so right down the bottom down to, say, 1,032 hertz, where it becomes much more perceptually uh, discernible, you see that there is a, a bit of a difference between the standard tone in the solid line and the dotted uh, a line which is showing the deviant tone, so the tone that is changed. And we can also see this on the right-hand panel as a difference. So if we subtract the two different waves, um, that's the mismatch response seen quite clearly. So it does increase as the physical difference differs. It also has a particular, this particular event-related potential component has a distinctive pattern of activity across the scalp. So um, it has stronger signals, which are indicated here in blue, so stronger negative signals uh, at the front of the head. And this is just some example uh, from another study on different accents of English. Now, if you remember to the earlier part of my talk where I mentioned sound is physical, but perceptually there are differences. Now, speech is one interesting case because... As far as the mismatch negativity response, and I'm about to sort of contradict myself here, I said it was, of course, driven a lot by physical changes, and it is. However, when it comes to things like speech, and there are some other examples, um, we actually see um, that mismatch negativity changes as a result of speech experience. So that we know that MMN is enhanced for native sp uh, speech sounds. So here's an example of a mismatch negativity wave to a Finnish vowel contrast. And the Finns and Hungarians who have learnt Finnish are showing almost equivalent kinds of activity. Whereas the Hungarians in the pink who haven't learnt Finnish at all aren't showing that response. So if you like, your, percep your perception is being also processed <laughs> as, uh, by the brain. So even though the physical stimulus is, is different. 
So it actually becomes rather a handy tool for looking at the process of speech sounds for language learners. So I can tell, you know, have, have they achieved native-like perception? So what about um, when participants pay attention to the sounds? Well, there's two ways in which they can pay attention. I can give them uh, a sound which is unexpected and unusual and surprising, and I see that in the brain activity doing something a little bit different. Or I can also ask participants to consciously attend to the sound. So both kinds of, of activity would cause the brain to give us a different kind of response, which is seen in a later stage of processing. Um, and, and we broadly call these a P3 group of responses. And it looks different to our uh, MMN or change detection response. So if you like here, here uh, uh, is, an, is a very simple example where you have irrelevant choices and then some desired choice. And then rather than the wave going up in a, in a negative, and by the way, it's, uh, it's a conve scientific convention. I don't know why negative is up in this particular sub-discipline and not down, but <laughs> it is. Uh, you get this positive wave uh, instead of a, a negative activity. So what have I learned? So that's your cra little crash course. That's your prep. <laughs> what have I learned about the brain changing its response to uh, different kinds of sounds based on your experience. So I'm just going to give you some highlights. Back um, earlier on in my career, I did a study on Morse code training. So we looked at uh, participants in Finland who were doing their military service. And as part of their military service, they learned to do Morse code. And we were interested in whether does that change their processing of beeps and tones, and particularly ones that are Morse code-like signals or not? Um, so we looked at a number of things, and I'm simplifying the story a little bit, but um, we looked at the, the brain changes in response to regularity of the stimulus, uh, frequency, which we understand as pitch, um, and duration. And we actually didn't find anything in the mismatch negativity. So at the pre-attentive level, we really didn't find anything in that, in that automatic change detection response. But what we did find was um, in the P3 responses, so when they were actively attending to the stimuli, um, so when they had an attentional switch, there was a difference um, in their responses to pitch. So this is before, during and after training. So before the training, you can see that uh, pitch, which is, or frequency, which is in the black solid bar, uh, starts off there. Then during, it goes up a bit. And then by the end, it's quite enhanced, significantly so, whereas the other features aren't. And we interpreted that as suggesting that they're tuning in to that particular frequency. And that, is, that was telling us uh, something about how that was changing their brain responses. We can also look at brain changes as a result of speech training. Now, I showed you an earlier study where they ha had people who were fluent in Finnish and so on. But we did our own studies using PC-based training for English-speaking sounds um, in Finnish speakers. And we found the brain's automatic change detection responses increased um, equivalent to the level of English speakers following training. So just here's a simple example from one condition. So these are our Finnish uh, speakers in the light line pre-training and in the solid line post-training. You can see there's a considerable enhancement as a result of, of the training that we did. And it's quite helpful for us as psychologists to gauge not only is this helping them behaviorally, but is this actually you know, having an effect on them that's equivalent to their native uh, uh, responses that we'd expect. Okay, and finally, I'd like to conclude on, on this particular theme with some thoughts around interaction with technology. Um, this has started to interest me because obviously this is a very sort of current topic. Um, what of our interaction with technology? Does it change brain responses? And I was interested in the common messaging signals that we're often bomb bombarded with these days. So the mobile phone tones, the email alerts, and so on. 
And what we did was we tested brain responses to two common sounds. So Outlook um, tone and the Android whistle. So just quickly play these for you. That's the Android whistle, if you, if you did not know it. And that's the Outlook tone. So, and we looked at both automatic and attended detection as well as work-life balance response, responses as well. And what we found was that automatic change detection did differ between the sounds. So the MMN responses to the Android tones were actually larger than the Outlook tones. And here's a graph showing the scalp map. So blue is a, is a larger signal in this, in this case. So it's giving us a larger signal for this particular component um, compared to the uh, Outlook tone. But this is not really that necessarily that exciting for a psychologist because we also, I also can tell you from other data that I collected alongside this that the Android sound is actually easier to hear at a perceptual level. There are different ways to kind of test that against the background noise. So it's not exactly that surprising. So you can just say, well, that's an effect that's just a purely physical level effect. But what about when we get asked people to actively attend or listen to the sounds? That's where the story gets a bit more interesting. So their brain activity shows a later signal, so a more positive wave, a bit like a P3 uh, wave that I spoke about, but where it's got a slightly different pattern to our usual P3, but never mind that. Um, and in here, um, the uh, red is the larger activity. You can see that the outlook uh, tones are actually giving us a stronger signal. So in other words, their attention is being more grabbed uh, by the Outlook tones than compared to the Android tones. And that's kind of surprising because the Outlook tones are, if you like, a little easy, less easy to discern against the background. Now, well, I also mentioned that we were collecting some work-life balance measures and our data showed that the association, there was an association <coughs> such that the faster that they responded to the Outlook sound, the more involved they were with their jobs and there was no such kind of effect with the Android tone. So we've interpreted this as possibly being due to Outlook messages signaling more of a work context. Now we will need more data and more participants to kind of confirm that, but that seems a pretty safe bet. Um, in the case of the Android whistle, it's primarily notifying text messages, which are kind of associated with the messages of getting something from your friend or your family and so on. Whereas your Outlook signal is, is delivering email messages, which is often work-related. So it seems to be quite an interesting, potentially interesting story there. So what does this all mean for our interaction with messaging sounds? Well, the brain does resp respond at a physical level for our automatic change detection. Uh, but it also says that when we actively attend, possibly the brain is firing for the sound that's more likely to be closely associated to work. And in future, I've got studies planned where we could perhaps trial some simple interventions, say switch off the sounds altogether for a time or replace it with a different kind of sound, perhaps have a degree of digital detox. Okay, and my final theme, as I mentioned, is about how we can sensibly use mobile devices for learning, and especially when we're considering uh, sounds, um, apps that use sound. So the context of this work, as I mentioned, started in early 2000 when I was working for Nokia, um, and you know, mobile devices were becoming more popular, with nowadays we've got all sorts of different kinds of mobile devices. And at that particular time, e-learning as a, as a field was kind of growing to become more interested in delivering some content on mobile devices. And it seemed like a very natural progression to take some of those content and ideas from the PC and put it on the mobile device. So, I mean, nowadays we have lots of examples of different mobile apps for learning. But it's, I think, important to ask the question of, is this really a good idea? Are we sensibly implementing them in a way that makes sense for the mobile devices? So I had some initial thoughts on mobile learning published almost 16 years ago, um, and I ran a fir the first spoken language um, app, which was a sort of phonetic, tr basic phonetic trainer for Japanese speakers of English on the old Nokia phones in the days where uh, programming meant something. <laughs> 
But there's still a lot that we don't know about the user experience for audio, so it might not be entirely physical. And just for a moment, I'm just going to give you a, a sort of little prime to kind of where I'm headed with this. As I think I've mentioned a couple of times before, sound just isn't about the physical sound, and I think here's a very interesting example for everyone. Okay, here we go. Baba. 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 Now, I want everyone to close your eyes, and I'll she'll keep on saying. Baba. 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 Okay, so hopefully, she was actually articulating the same thing the whole way. So, probably you heard something like da da or da da when you were watching her, but equally when you were closing your eyes, you probably just heard baba. Yeah. And it is an auditory illusion. So, what's happening there is you're getting the visual input of her saying gaga and the auditory input of baba, and you're brain fuses these two. So that's what we call the McGurk effect. And I think it's quite a neat demonstration of the extent to which sound is influenced by context. And my research question is, now when we think about mobile technologies, is the device that we're using having an influence on people's perception of sound? Is the application context having an influence on people's perceptions of the sound? Would phones seem better for people? Um, or worse than other, other devices. And so that was the line of research that I was very much interested in. And I have uh, had a really neat opportunity to sort of test this out experimentally. So I've got two ad uh, devices which uh, we used in our study, so an ordinary iPad and an iPhone. And believe it or not, checking up the te technical specs, if you use headphones, these two have identical sound output. So theoretically, there should be no discernible difference between the two. The differences, of course, in screen resolution, but nothing that's relevant to sound. And we tested two kinds of software. So we tested a valve trainer, which had a very simple um, interface. So it was just focused mainly on the sounds and not very much kind of visually going on. And then a Learn English um, application, which was more focused on grammar and had lots of video and was much more sort of text rich. And just a flavor of our results, really. I mean, there's lots more to unpack. But participants gave better ratings, uh, sound quality ratings, on the iPad than they did for the iPhone. And we thought at the time that this probably could be due to size, this sense of the iPad being perhaps perceived as a more powerful device. We also found, inter uh, interestingly, effects of content type. So participants rated um, sound quality. We also used uh, different kinds of uh, clips. So there was audio only clips that were either audio book or music clips, and then an audio aspect of video clip. And again, we, we equated as far as possible the physical differences between these stimuli, so there probably wasn't much discernible. But very interestingly, the audio aspect of the video clip was rated significantly worse. So participants in the presence of video rated the sound worse. But interestingly, does this affect the user's preferences for how, you know, which device they're using? And I think it was very interesting to find that despite the fact that they rated the iPhones as being worse, when it came to the simple Val Trainer application, they actually preferred the iPhone. So it was as if they were saying, well, yeah, maybe it did sound a bit worse, but actually I prefer the convenience because I'm, I'm less interested for, the, for that simple application. So it's suggesting for us that even perceptions of sound quality aren't necessarily driving their decisions. And we've more recently done some follow-up work with musical training apps. So we've used iPads, uh, iPhones, and then now we have an intermediary, the iPad mini. And we also tested musical training apps. Now this time we've got a very different story. The iPhones won. <laughs> this time, but it was four years later. 
and the results probably reflect the way in which users perceive um, and, and use these various devices now. So nowadays we have a lot more smartphones, as it were, as compared to four years ago, and this may be driving that effect. But the other results uh, were the same as for previous. Now, just to conclude on this theme, um, I've been involved in a research project on child user experiences with language technology. And that's kind of been a very interesting journey for me because I've done a lot of my work um, on language technologies with adults, but this is the first time I've done user studies with children. And I've been involved in a, in a project called Say It Again Kid, um, which is a game-based uh, speech learning application which is being developed by colleagues in Alto University and University of Helsinki. And the computer or mobile device is, is used and the device scores as pronunciation, not just um, the degree to which they're hearing the sounds correctly. And they have a game-based environment which looks like this and it has, they wander around, there's different levels, different worlds that they explore and they pick up these little sort of game boards and within, underneath each of these particular cards, they're um, introduced to a new, uh, uh, sound that they, they haven't uh, learnt before. And they're getting narration both in their native language and, uh, by way of instruction and then also English language instruction as well. And just to give you some highlights, I mean, we are not finished this project, but in terms of kind of measuring the user experience in, in children, as I said, it's quite different to adults. So we need quite simple measures and the children's interpretations of the questions are not the same often. So we ideally want to get a good index of their affective or emotional response, so how much they like it, but also their perceived educational value. Are they finding this helpful for their learning? So in terms of kind of ga gauging their emotional reactions, we use this sort of smileyometer um, methodology, which is much easier for us uh, to gauge uh, reactions from children. They, under, they relate to that better than they do to Likert scale numbers and questionnaires that we use for adults. But in terms of educational value, it's quite hard for a, children to, a child to get uh, to grips with that kind of question, what's the educational value? So we ask them instead the question of, would my teacher like this? And past research has shown that this is a really good approach for, for asking children um, you know, about the perceived educational value because you get a very different result for this question than to the question of whether the child would like the game. So initial data, um, so confirming our suspicions that the, the teachers uh, are rated more ambivalent in terms of whether they would like their game as opposed to whether the children would like the game for themselves. So it does suggest that... Uh, they're interesting, they're engaged by it, but they're not really quite sure about the educational value. Is this, is this, is my teacher going to think this is a really good idea and good for me? The other, other findings is that um, children don't necessarily fi like finding, having their voice played back. So as I said before, they're having their pronunciation scored by the device. Um, and they're, they're given ratings. And I think they find that quite challenging, but they do find it helpful for their learning. And the other thing, which you know, may be a bit different to adults and we need more data to look at, is the children actually prefer to play the game within a group uh, rather than alone. And I think that's often how children like to engage with games anyway. Um, and interestingly enough, it was sort of an incidental finding. They scored, as I said, mentioned, they have both... Um, uh, their native Finnish language narration as well as some English uh, instruction. They rated the English samples as having less clear sound quality than their native Finnish uh, playback instructions. And that could reflect, um, you know, the, the sort of native, non-native non differences um, in the perception of the speech, um, possibly spilling over to quality. In terms of next steps with this project, we're obviously going to analyse the educational outcomes, so performance on the game and brain changes, and we've been collecting some control data here in the UK in conjunction with one of our collaborators, Anastasia, who's sitting in the audience. And um, we're also comparing whether uh, the child user experience differs to the adults, um, and that's work planned in the springtime um, in Helsinki, and that's funded by, kindly by Nokia Foundation. 
So to conclude, um, what can we conclude so far? The way that we speak to language learners may help them hear the speech sounds better. So helpfully, hopefully, helpfully helping their language learning. And secondly, the brain does change its responses as a result of experience. So that could be language experience, it could be structured training, or it could even be everyday exposure as in the case of digital sounds. And finally, context, especially device context, application context, has effects on the perception of sound quality in users and hence potentially its effect on learning. Finally, conclude with a note of thanks to many, many people over the course of my career, my supervisors, my mentors, uh, my former PhD students, postdocs, collaborators, um, and some very special thanks to my family and friends for their support and encouragement over the years, and some friends and colleagues who have given me valuable uh, feedback on earlier iterations of this talk. And not the least of which, uh, I we should very much thank uh, the various funding bodies that have funded different projects along the way. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Maria. Uh, my name is Neil Marriott. I'm a professor at the university, and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, I'm doing the job that Liz normally does. <laughs> um, first of all, um, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it a lot. And you learn something new every day, don't you? I learned an awful lot today. I've learned that ah, Maria's come a long way to Winchester. Ecuador, Australia, Portsmouth, Brunel and Winchester. <laughs> I thought I came a long way when I came from Cardiff, but there we are. That was just on the M4 down the A34. But uh, I'm now going to uh, teach you something new today as well, if I may, which is uh, I've learned something about language and I under now understand why there's less than 12 words in English than there are in Welsh. There's similar words, which you think is strange given the close border that there is between us. Uh, but I'm now going to tell you one of the words that comes from a Welsh sailor who uh, was on board a ship uh, sailed by someone called Magellan when he went round your home continent of South America. And I now know that this is probably something called the McGurk effect. Because <laughs> when the Welsh sailor was asked, what are those birds over there? The Welsh sailor replied, whiteheads, or as you call them, penguins. So, <laughs> so that's one of the few Welsh words that you have in the English language. There's obviously a mis misheard uh, effect. So please join me once more in thanking Maria uh, for an excellent, fascinating and informative inaugural lecture. And well done indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave.